All right, hello everybody, it's me, Daniel D, with the Crazy Comedy, Humor, and Satire Podcast for Sunday, January 19th, 2020. This is episode number 30. How the hell are you, my fellow Americans? Um, on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day Eve, um, yeah, the Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday is tomorrow, and, um, yeah, I think his dream is certainly, uh, you know, there's work to be done, but there's we've come a long way in, how long has it been, 50 years? 55, 56? I don't know. I suck at math, so. Anyway, it's been a, it's been a while, but within li- living memory, you know, we've come a long way uh, towards realizing his dream that one day, uh, people would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Unless they're Asian and they're trying to get into Harvard, and then we will judge those fuckers by the color of their skin. Say, no, there's too many of you guys at fucking Harvard, you know, with your perfect ACT scores and your, like, insane work ethic and your, you know, mathematical brilliance. You fucking uh, Chinese people need to, you know, take a, take a step back. Let some more of us uh, honkies in or some... You know, blacks or some Hispanics, you know, there's uh, not enough of us. So uh, then, you know, in some cases, it's okay still to judge people by the color of their skin. You know, if they're Asian with a perfect SAT score and uh, yeah, you know, you, you got to stop them and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, to make America really as diverse as it ought to be in the name of racial equality, we got to be racist here and say, you Asians, get the fuck out. You know, maybe like, you know, you're what, 4% of the population. And yet, um, if you look at a, a distribution of like perfect ACT scores and perfect SAT scores are probably like 90% of those, you know? So, hey, I mean, what, are we going to let the Asians take over our, uh, you know, Ivy League institutions? No. So rightfully so, Harvard has decided to be racist, you know, where necessary, in the name of racial equality. They gotta be racist, they gotta put a stop to these Asians, and they have. Now they're getting sued by these fucking un-American Asian lawyers and Asians and all that, just, you know, trying to say, hey, why are you discriminating against us just because we're uh, working harder and, you know, we're working smarter? And the rest of you American slobs, you know, why should we be discriminated against? Um, so anyway, so that lawsuit's going on now. But in the name of racial equity and racial equality, we just got to discriminate against the Asians. You know, it's just the way it is. All right. So anyway, um, I did watch the Muppet movie this weekend. And I thought, you know, we've come a long way. I, you know, the the Muppet movie. You now, this movie came out in 1979. But I remember seeing it as a kid. And, of course, the, the real uh, lesson of it didn't hit me at the time when I saw it. But now as an adult that I see it, I, uh, you know, I've got to say, I like, you know, Martin Luther King gave the speech, the I Have a Dream speech, 1963, on the, Link- and the you know, Washington Mall, the Lincoln Memorial, um, you know. And there, a mere 16 years later, thanks to his vision, a cow, no, not a cow, a pig, a pig and a frog were able to engage in an interspecies romance, you know? I mean, America really is a land of opportunity, because where else could a poor, humble frog born in the swamps of Florida, you know, uh, find his way to Hollywood where he would fall in love with a pig, and the two of them would be uh, a leading gent and a la- leading lady in, uh, you know, one of the the decade's uh, greatest movies of all time, uh, the Muppet movie, the original one before Disney took them over and, you know, kind of fucked the whole Muppet franchise up, back when the Muppets were, like, legit. Yeah, Kermit the Frog, you know, and Miss Piggy. Now, of course... Had they used real-life animals instead of puppets, it would have been a short movie, you know? Uh, Kermit the Frog, you know, even if they gave, even if they used a bullfrog, you know, it would have had a very uh, challenging time propositioning a full-grown sow, you know, because I think a female pig probably weighs like 
I don't know, 800 pounds or something like that. So this big fat sow pig rolling around in the mud. Here comes Kermit the bullfrog hopping over, hop, hop, hop. And, uh, you know, he tries to, you know, tell Miss Piggy his love and she steps on him and that's the end of the movie. Um, you know, if, you know, if it was true to life and if Kermit the Frog tried to make love to Miss Piggy, like she would not even know. It was one of those things like, is it in there yet? Is it in? I can't feel nothing. It would be Miss Piggy. So Kermit the Frog, hi ho, I'm Kermit the Frog here. And, uh, geez, Miss Piggy. You know, he would he would try to make love to her like she'd be laying on her side. You know, he'd come hopping up, like try to go froggy style, you know. And uh, she'd be saying, uh, Kermit, is, a, is it in there? I can't feel nothing. Hi ho, I'm, I think I'm almost inside. And, you know, that would, anyway, he'd probably go up the wrong hole, go up her ass or something like that, and then she'd take a shit and kill him. All right, so. Totally off the wall. Uh, Martin Luther King Day. How did I get from that onto a porno starring Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy? I don't fucking know. But anyway, a um, little bit of uh, current affairs politics for you. We've gotten a, a couple of uh, candidates who left the race. And so I am going to play them their own going down the fucking toilet uh, sound effect. Uh, I don't know if I did last week. Kurt Corey Booker. But Cory Booker is out. He couldn't do enough to distinguish himself as the only, um, you know, black man still left in the primary. Uh, really, the only person of color still in the primary. Oh, wait, I forgot. We got Elizabeth Warren. She is Native American. Okay, so uh, aside from Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker was the only person of color, the only person of African descent still in the primary. But he couldn't do enough to distinguish himself from all the white people uh, who were running. So he, unfortunately, he's out of the race. So here is a uh, the sound of Cory Booker's campaign getting flushed down the fucking toilet! Boom! All right. Goodbye and good riddance, Cory Booker. Um, he did uh, endorse Bernie Sanders, though, which is cool. So, yeah, you know, go Bernie. Feel the burn, man. Um... <clears throat> then I totally forgot. This is actually a couple of weeks old, but sh her campaign was already in the shitter. And so I wasn't even aware that she had dropped out until like a week or so after the fact. And it was like, I think it was when I was reading about Cory Booker dropping out. Then I discovered that the voodoo high priestess, Marianne Williamson, the crystal ball reading fortune telling candidate, unfortunately, her crystal ball didn't let her know that she was going to fucking lose. And it could have saved her a lot of time and saved her a lot of money. Well, or her supporters a lot of money, you know. Yeah, you know, too bad. I guess the the, the secret or whatever that, that book, that movie that revolutionized Oprah's life, you know. Uh, maybe Marianne Williamson didn't practice the secret hard enough. Maybe she didn't have enough positive energy and positive thinking about her campaign, you know, she, she probably woke up and really like secretly thought like, I'm going to lose, I'm a loser. And that became her reality. Well, just goes to show the power of the secret there. So anyway, here is the sound of Marianne Williamson and her fortune telling new age, uh, hippy dippy campaign going right down the fucking toilet. <coughs> It was already in the shitter, so, I mean, yeah, what else is new? Um, I, re I didn't watch the debate. I think it's a waste of time, though, the Democrat debate. Uh, my guy, Andrew Yang, wasn't invited. And Tulsi Gabbard wasn't invited either. I, I can see myself voting for her. Uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, he's saying fuck the banks. I mean, I, I ignore a lot of the crazy shit that he says, but I do agree with him on fucking Wall Street and the investment bankers. I mean, those guys have fucked us, so... We should be able to fuck them in return, you know? Here's my thing, man. It's like if Wall Street and the and the investment bankers are going to fuck us, they need to give us free movies, free drinks, you know? Because it's only right. Like, you get fucked, you know, the person who's fucking you, at least they can buy your dinner. At least they can buy, pay for your movie ticket, you know? It's like, so, so that's what I think. I think the Wall Street bankers owe us. You know, they've been fucking us Americans for so fucking long now, fucking the entire world, really. They owe us free movies and free drinks and free dinner at a minimum. 
at a fucking minimum. Those guys have been fucking us. We haven't got shit to show for it. So, Bernie Sanders, if you're listening, please adopt that as your campaign. It's like, oh, these banks, these bankers need to pay their fair share. They've been fucking the American people now for so long. They have not even paid for their dinner or a movie. The American people have been paying for it all and then taking it up the ass. And um, because I love my LGBTQ brothers and sisters, I've got nothing against people taking it up the ass. But if you're going to take it up the ass, it needs to be consensual. And you probably need, uh, if you're going to be uh, good about it, you need to pay for uh, you know the, the date, the dinner, the movie ticket, all that before you fuck somebody up the ass. That's what uh, Bernie Sanders should say. You know? um, call it like it is. So yeah, anyway, um, back to the holiday and celebration of the Reverend Dr. King. Um, I think that they should give Malcolm X a holiday, you know? Um, and just, like, make it a day where uh, black boys, you know, can go up to uh, old white Republican men and just punch them in the fucking face, you know? By any means necessary, you motherfucker. Bow! Uh, you know... All right, that wouldn't be popular with the majority of the people. I understand that. Uh, but uh, Malcolm X actually, okay, in all seriousness, he's a, he's a remarkable person. I mean, so is the Reverend Dr. King, but Malcolm X, uh, his autobiography is really a good read. The guy is really a remarkable individual. Um, but one of the things that I respect the most about Malcolm X is that dude was willing to change his mind. He was willing to consider new evidence, new information, new perspectives. You know, it's like, and he talks about that in his book. Of course, he, you know, he, his, even if he had never made his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca and had this kind of awakening about Islam and the bigger picture and, and the meaning of race and light of everything, you know, where he kind of really changed his mind and perspective on race and racial matters it's like even if he even if he hadn't done that, he would still be a remarkable person, definitely a, a, a noteworthy historical figure. But the fact that I mean, here he is, he's like tied to his identity, is so caught bound up in the nation of Islam and this kind of racial politics, which I totally I'm white, you know, so it's one of those things like I, I can't endorse it, obviously, but I understand I'm not gonna say I understand it. I I can see why somebody like him in his situation coming up when he did, you know, his, his seeing his life, his family, you know, his parents, um, I think his mom was had, you know, in and out of mental institutions is like his, um, dad was killed. His siblings, they were kind of split up a lot, you know, be, and in foster care. It's like, you see the effects of systematic, you know, hardcore racism that existed in the United States at that time like crushing the lives of people around you and and uh in his own case you know being denied opportunities being you know um i mean hey if i was him if i was at that point in the history if i was a young black man i would have been probably even more pissed off than malcolm x you know because yeah i mean this is this is a horrible thing you read about the actual the, the history of this country and some of the things that have, we've done to people you know of color i mean it's a egregious you know um so i totally understand it but the thing that with malcolm x is not just that he took that anger and and you know he he you know ultimately kind of bettered himself and tried to better his community and you know it wasn't just about him it was really about lifting up people around him you know um and it sounds angry to us today is if you're white if you're in the 21st century but it's like in the time you know yeah totally understandable why you would be you know, talking so much shit about the white man, given all that white men had done to people like you. Yeah, you know, I totally understand it. But the fact, though, that he was, he turned, channeled it into a positive direction, but then it's like he just, he kept growing throughout his life. You know, he's like, he goes to Mecca, he sees, you know, a bigger picture of Islam, not just the nation of Islam, which is kind of like a skewed version of Islam. It's more like a political movement, a racial movement, than it is a, a like the Islam, the religion. But anyway, so he goes over, he sees Islam in a new light. He sees humanity 
race in a new light. And he's like, and it changes him. He allows himself to be changed and he, and he acknowledges it. You know, he isn't, he isn't like, cause it's hard to imagine some people who are so tied to their poli- public positions on whether it's politics or religion or whatever, you know, really changing their mind like that. Cause it's a huge thing. It would be as if like, say Rush Limbaugh, right? Um, known for being this right wing Republican, you know, uh, conservative guy was to suddenly one day, you know, he has some, some experience and he says, you know, maybe I've been wrong about all this, you know, and he, and he says, you know what? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we should have the government do more to correct for, you know, inequality in the, in opportunity that exists, you know, that maybe they should break up concentrations of economic power and resources, you know, say the Rush Limbaugh was to, to say, that. I mean, it would take a lot of guts for somebody like him to come out and, and say, you know what, I've changed my mind. I've adopted a new position. But that's exactly what Malcolm X did. So I was like, I got to really hand it to that guy. He should, they should have a holiday for him. Uh, but certainly Martin Luther King, you know, a uh, great man, you know, really a lot of bravery, a lot of courage. A lot of those guys, him, Fred Shuttlesworth, Ralph Abernathy. I mean, a lot of brave, you know, real pa- patriots. When you look at people who really made America a better place, you know, maybe you could, some of the people on the, some of the older generation of old white, you know, people, especially in the South, will like to say, oh, you know, well, he's not the most moral person because of his, you know, sexual misconduct, or, you know, because I guess he did cheat on his wife, as did JFK, as did Bill Clinton, as did Donald Trump, you know, they're pretty selective in who they like to bring that up about. But the fact that you're able to, um, you know, get people who are so oppressed at the time, you know, in the 19, early 1960s, I mean, you just looked at, look at the footage of the kids getting, you know, blasted with full power, you know, fire hoses and dogs being sicked on children for doing nothing except holding up signs, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you see the brute racism, you know, the inhumanity. And the fact that you're able to get people who, like, have been smacked around and have every reason to be pissed off and want to hit back to say, no, we're going to do this nonviolently. We're going to, you know, protest peacefully. We're going to honor your humanity, even though you're not honoring ours. I mean, that's really something. So it's like truly, you know, a a person who deserves to be celebrated in every way. So, um, but I did want to say, you know, okay, uh, in the, in the interest of uh, bringing people together, you know, racial equality, I think I'd like to put in a plug for interracial romance because, of course, you know, the more you're related to people, the harder it is to hate, you know, um, as Neil Brennan put it, you know, in his special three mics. It's like a, it's hard to hate someone if you don't know what exactly they are, you know, uh, what box, what category to put them in. Because that's kind of what race is. It's like tribalism. It's wanting to put people in these neat little categories. OK, you're this so I can uh, project these expectations onto you. And this is your place in society. It's like the way kids, you know, young kids like to to categorize things like, well, this is a dog. This is a cat. It's like we human beings like to put stuff in categories. So it's like, uh, you know, um, you need nuance in understanding the beings as complex, as multifaceted as human beings, you know. Uh, but yeah, so I think interracial romance is a good way to do it. You know, everybody needs to just fucking until we're like a light shade of brown. You know, everybody looks like. Middle Eastern or uh, Brazilian or, you know, Puerto Rican or something like that where you're kind of or Polynesian where you're like, well, I don't know what this guy is. He's a little, looks well, kind of black, kind of white, kind of Asian. I don't know. Um, that would really do it. Now, the first time I remember back when I was younger, uh, this was before it was a thing, but, you know, I was a girl, a Jasmine in one of my classes, and this was like... Uh, Back before there was the internet, so that I didn't, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white uh, household, in a predominantly white suburb, in a pre- and went to a predominantly white schools and all that. So it was like, you know, I didn't know what black girls like, but she was really pretty. So I was like, I wanted to, you know, put the moves on her, right? Um, so I was like, I needed to do my research. You know, what are black girls like? You know, so I went to the media, right? Because that's where if you're going to get good information about a race of people and what they like and what they do, you know, go to the media because the media won't won't spin it um, 
you know, well, they'll, they'll give it to you straight. They'll tell you like it is, right? And, of course, this was the late 80s. Uh, so by the media, I was a kid. I mean MTV, you know? So I went to MTV, right? Because MTV, it's like you, you know, see some videos. And in some of those videos, I see guys getting black girls. And like, so I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do what they do. So the first thing I did, I went, uh, you know, I saw Michael Jackson. Michael motherfucking Jackson. That guy seemed to be like a pimp. Every single video he had, almost. You know, he was with some hot-looking mama, you know? So it was like the Thriller video. He's got Ola Ray, who was a Playboy playmate. Uh, Very pretty. He had, (laughs) you know, other videos. I I think he had, like, Iman in one of his, or maybe not Iman. He had, uh, I can't remember. But, I mean, he had... He, Naomi Campbell, I think, in one. Anyway, he he had he managed. He appeared. Now, of course, behind closed doors, he was fucking around with the little white boys, you know. So, uh, but in public, at least, you know, at least in his videos, according to what I was seeing on MTV at the time, Michael Jackson seemed like he was the man. You know, he was getting a lot of good-looking, um, dark-skinned women. And so it's like, hey, you know, uh, maybe I can adopt some of his techniques to get Jasmine to give me the time of day. You know, so. Went home. I uh, I didn't have a sequin glove, and I couldn't afford one. But I, you know, took a little rubber latex glove, you know, that you use to wash dishes, and I, I put glue and glitter on it, you know, to make it like shiny. And I put it on my my right hand, and I dressed up, you know, had the top hat, and everything, and I practiced the the moonwalk. Uh, it didn't exactly look like a moonwalk. Maybe it looked kind of like a like a meteor shower walk or something like that. But anyway. So I saw Jasmine coming, and I came out and go, hee, hee, hee. And I, you know, did the spin move and, like, kick my leg up like Michael Jackson does. And then, you know, grabbed my crotch and kind of went, bom, 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 You know, while thrusting my, you know, crotch up and down with my hand. Um, I'm sorry, this is audio only, so you can't, like, see me actually doing this, you know. Uh, so then I was, like, got through, you know, spun around. And then twirled my hat like Michael Jackson did in the, you know, in a thriller, like kind of th- tossed it. And I was like, where the fuck did you go, Jasmine? You you missed me. She was walking down the street. She didn't even stop to see it. So I was like yelling after her, like, whoa, ran up, you know, started doing like Michael Jackson did with Ola Ray in the thriller video, you know, dancing around her. And she was like, boy, if you don't get the fuck away from me, I'm going to call the cops. I said, all right. So Michael Jackson led me astray, you know. I went to him, you know, his videos to try to get tips on how to get a cute black girl to like me. Didn't exactly work out. So I went back to the media, a.k.a. MTV, and, uh, you know, I started watching again. I noticed another uh, young brother who was getting a lot of play from the ladies. Uh, In fact, he had a lot of ladies saying, we want easy. Yep, easy motherfucking E. I said, Easy E is the fucking man. Easy was getting pussy like left and right, like it wasn't no thing, you know. Um, so I was like, well, okay, so let me let me let me try to adopt some of Easy E's techniques. So, you know, I didn't have enough money to get a gold chain. So what I did was I took a um a regular chain, you know, off of a bike, and I spray painted it yellow and I put it around my neck, you know. And so I had that, and I, I got a, a black Raiders hat, and, uh, you know, dressed in all black. I didn't know at the time, of course, that Easy by dressing in all black, which is trying to stay neutral, no gang affiliations, you know, uh, so that he wouldn't get into any beef, you know, with the Crips or the Bloods. But anyway, so so I started, you know, I got a boombox and a cassette tape of N.W.A. and the Posse, one of the awesomest uh, cassette tapes. I ever had, um, you know, it was, it was some of the singles from that predated their classic straight out of Compton album. But anyway, so NWA and the Posse, I had that on my boombox and I started cruising down the street in my six, four. Well, I didn't have a six, four. I had an eight, four and it wasn't a car. It was a bike. It was a one speed, uh, huffy bicycle. So I was cruising down the street in my eight, four with my boombox. Blasting Easy E with my gold bike chain around my neck, and or my yellow painted bike chain around my neck, and I even had a bottle of Old English Eight Hundred that I found in a dumpster 
It was empty, so I had to fill it up to make it look like I was drinking. So, you know, I put in some, uh, you know, I was a kid, so I couldn't get beer. Uh, My parents were teetotalers, meaning they didn't drink at all. So I had to uh, put some water and some food coloring to try to make it look like beer. It was like yellow, so it kind of looked more like piss, which is about what 8-Ball tastes like if you ever had Old English 800. Um, It's cheap, though. You can get like a 40-ounce for like 99 cents. Something like that. But anyway, so I had, I was cruising down the street in my 8-4, pedaling my bike, looking to skull. And I uh, had my uh, boombox, blasting Easy e um, And I was had my 40-ounce bottle, old English 800, uh, that looked like piss. And I was, wasn't drinking it, but, you know, I like, had it. So I looked like I'd be really hardcore. I didn't have a gat, uh, you know. I mean, I had to do what I could with what I had. So anyway, but I, I rode up, saw Jasmine walking down the street. And I rode around in these circles around her, blasting Easy e And I was like, all right, so I'm going to approach her. I'm going to step to her the way Easy approaches his women, you know? So I was like, yo, bitch. And uh, next thing I knew, I was getting some tender love and care from a black girl. Uh, it was the nurse in the hospital. I kind of lost consciousness. She, I didn't know that black girls knew karate. So this particular black girl was a black belt in one of the martial arts. And she did this roundhouse kick. And uh, anyway, that was that. Um, I never did get Jasmine to go out with me. But I had fortunately had more success in more recent years. Now there's better information out there too uh, for young kids, young white boys who are like lame like I was, you know. Because I'm not the kind of guy that women just pursue, you know. I always kind of envied those those guys, you know, the people that look like Brad Pitt or whoever. It's like uh, like somebody joked, you know, it was only sexual harassment with Harvey Weinstein because he looked so fucking ugly. No, I'm just kidding. He, he was pretty sick. Okay, so I won't even go there. But it, it, basically the joke was if it's Brad Pitt, it's not sexual harassment because it's like women want to be sexually harassed by somebody or not sexually harassed, but, you know, hit on, flirted with. It's like, what's the difference between a sexual remark to a woman that is flirting and one that is uh, sexual harassment? Well, if the guy is, is hot and the woman thinks he's hot and it's like, oh, shit, you know, I didn't know he thought of me like that. Then it's like, welcome. If it's like, ooh, gross. This guy's fucking creepy. Then it's like he's ugly and, you know, that makes it harassing. But anyway, where was I with all this? Uh, bottom line was I'm not one of those guys that women look at and they're like, oh, I hope he's noticing me. You know, some guys manage to get women to just pursue them. Me? The only way I could get women to pursue me is if I steal their purses. But then the police would pursue me too, so that wouldn't exactly work out. But anyway, now there's better information out there for those of you people who want to date interracially and have interracial romance. You know, know that you are helping to obscure the racial boundaries and the racial lines by our, you know, multiracial, racially ambiguous offspring. So uh, anyway, in honor of Martin Luther King, uh, go out and, you know, do that. Anyway, I hope you have a good holiday for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Day on tomorrow. Um, Anyway, this is the Crazy Comedy Humor and Satire Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel D., and this is episode number 30, which will air virtually on Sunday, January 19th, 2020. Peace out, y'all.